Okay, first of all, uh, welcome to Training Vision Institute. Right, uh, thank you for taking your time out of your schedule and coming by. Uh, we also have some audience who are streaming live. Thank you as well for tuning in. So uh, let me just uh, give you a brief introduction about where we are at. We are at Training Vision Institute, our school. And uh, let me give you a bit of profile of uh, who I am as well. I'm your host for today. My name is uh, Ting Su, as you can see. For some Chinese, they'll find it quite easy to remember la, <laughs> and pronounce that. So yeah, so I'll be your host for today. I'll be taking you through onto this whole program, right? Uh, at the same time to introduce to you our guest speaker and the content that you guys uh, definitely are here for today. Okay, so to give you a bit brief, or brief info about uh, who I am and what I do. So I've been with Training Vision Institute for the past three years. Right, I have been uh, helping out with our expansion and partnership overseas as well as locally. Right, of course, but due to the current nature of things, uh, most of what I've been doing is local student-to-student -student, uh, partnerships and student consultation. Okay, so that's a little bit of what I do here. So basically, for myself, I'm uh, someone who's very passionate at helping students uh, reach their academic goals, and that's why I happen to come into this uh, industry itself. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So to give you an idea of who we are, Training Vision Institute, we are an institute, a private education institute, and basically for us, our vision again and mission is to basically to empower and help students along in their academic journey. Right. So as you can see, uh, we hope to be the leader in human and organizational development to be able to develop students' potential. So we believe that every single individual, when they come into our doors, uh, whatever they are looking for, if we have and we are able to match and assist them, right, we would definitely like to do that to be able to empower them with skills so that they can uh, progress in terms of their career. A lot of people see education as a step forward you know, into a better career. Some see it as definitely a way to upgrade themselves and add value to their lives. So we definitely love to see that. And our mission is to do that. Okay, through applied knowledge, best practices, and through an innovative mindset. All right. Um, these are the values of our company as well. So just to give you an idea of what we do, right? So as you can see, our staff here, they're all in the red polo t-shirts. So all of them are part of Training Vision. If you ever you know, have anything you want to reach out to them, feel free to approach them anytime. Right? And for us, what we do, basically, this is a little bit of the values that we try and uh, follow through, right? So we are a spiritually driven organization. We believe in ethics, or we believe in doing things right. We are very passionate about what we do, which is education and empowering people's lives. We believe in innovation, right? Creating new ideas, creating new causes, uh, and making sure that we are always, you know, uh, together with the trend. We are very responsive in videos as well, right? For student inquiries, uh, if you have questions anytime, you know, feel free to text us, email us. We'll be more than happy to respond and reach out to you and assist you in any way we can, okay? But we believe in individual growth, not just for students, but even for individual staff as well. So we try and make sure that everyone who comes here, they are not only just, uh, you know, taking a class or even just uh, going through the motion of an 8 to 5 job, but we are focusing on them being able to develop themselves in their journey with us. But lastly, we believe in teamwork. I mean, we all know that uh, teamwork is something that we all need to succeed, and that's what we believe in in our organization as well, all right? Next slide, please. So this is uh, who we are, basically a brief summary. Okay, we have been around for about 30 plus years. Any one of you all heard of Train Vision before coming down? Or is this everyone's first time hearing of us? Here before? Yeah. Sorry? Standing first class. Standing first class, yeah, great. Yeah. So, so anyone else? I mean, some of you may have heard of. Uh, I, ever, I, I attended. Oh, you've attended before? Yeah. Great. So we have a returning <laughs> student, yeah. So some of us, of course, uh, might be our first time hearing about us. So I wanted to give you a brief summary of uh, who we are. So we have been in the market for 30 years, right? And we are basically an EduTrust certified private education institute. It means we achieve a certain level in terms of our standards, right? We, of course, provide SkillsFuture Singapore related courses. So for people who are wondering, you know, about WS Skills, Skills Future, mainly focusing on adult learning, we cater that to individuals, okay? We have over 800 uh, companies that we have worked with, different partnerships, whether is it staff trainings or even talking about uh, program partnerships, okay? And at the same time, we have over 120,000 learners that have uh, walked through our doors and graduated and progressed through the class that we are very proud to, of course, have. Okay? We have five different training campuses all over. You are at, sitting at our Cathay campus. We have a campus at Jurong, Gem. We have a campus at Tampines, at Haogang and Woodlands as well. All right? And of course, we have our certified pracademics. Pracademics are our trainers or lecturers, all right? They are academics. But at the same time, we call them pracademics because they are practicing as well. 
So very commonly, when you talk about the causes we have, the lecturers are not just lecturers, but they basically have been in the industry or they are in the industry and they are practicing, you know, what they are actually teaching as well. Right, so we believe that can actually add value to students that are with us. Okay, we have different partnerships as well, a total of nine, right? Different university partnerships that, of course, we plan to take it further to the next level to be able to cater uh, more programs for people that are actually keen in what we do. Okay, so these are some of our global academic partners, as you can see. Now, we have collaborations with EC Council, Boston University, uh, SMU, okay, just to name a few. So these are people that we have worked with, sorry, these are organizations and universities that we have the honor to work with over the past 30 years. All right, uh, next slide. These are partners that we have worked with as well, clients and partners that we have went over to train their staff. So they believe in our training model, our training system, and the courses that we provide because they see the value of that training to be able to assist them to, uh, to actually perform better as an organization and company. Okay. Campus locations, uh, basically higher education campus locations where we are at, city campus, and of course our gym campus, these are where we provide more of our higher education courses, here's just the information. Okay, but of course all our courses, uh, sorry, all our campuses are here, as you can see. Toward me and look so weak. I've never seen you with such tired eyes. And everything we said we'd be, we just traded for a suit coat and a tie. Socks and shoes right off That natural light Is so damn polite Can make you feel just like you were young Again oh, 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 oh. Standing underneath Under our clothes, a fire grows We are ready for this life of running wild We're running wild Underneath the rose of trees I will see you where the ocean meets the sky Under your toes, a fire grows You are ready for a different kind of life You're shining for the wind is cold must return to the wild
So I hope the video gives you guys a glimpse into uh, a journey of a student over here. Of course, a lot of us, we hope to progress on to the next chapter uh, after our education. And that's what Training Vision we hope to empower you with. Okay, so the highlight of today, uh, what we are looking forward to is definitely our cybersecurity seminar, right? Um, talking about the top 10 things to take note of, the trends, all right, in terms of cybersecurity, as well as what are the kind of tips we can actually uh, take away for ourselves on a personal level. So today uh, we have our uh, privilege, we are privileged to have our speaker, Mr. Gerald Tang, all right, to share with you a little bit about his profile. He is one of the academias that are with us in Training Vision Institute that uh, teach in our advanced diploma in cybersecurity. And he himself definitely he manages uh, strategic partnerships, okay, cyber, cyber security related companies, okay, in terms of strategies, definitely processes, as well as audits. So without further ado, let us give uh, Mr. Gerald a loud round of applause. Mr. Gerald, please. Yep, thanks, Chief okay, Sir. Yep. Welcome. Yes, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, it's rainy day outside, so I uh, really appreciate your time to come over as well. So I'm actually a trainer in this uh, TVI, and I also teaching the advanced uh, diploma in cybersecurity. Right today, uh, it's a good, great opportunity uh, for me to share about the trends and some of the tips that probably you can uh, take note of. All right, because in this uh, cybersecurity uh, landscape of uh, today, there's a lot of things is uh, changing, and there's a lot of challenges as well. But then again, that also create opportunities. Uh, as potential learners yourself to embark on this journey to become a cybersecurity professional. Should there be an interest too, right? Next slide. All right. So I'm going to talk about the trends. And before that, uh, let's watch a short video, right? So that uh, we understand the cyberspace, how far you come up and uh, the cybersecurity yeah. landscape all right, of today. Yep. To imagine life without the internet but it was created just decades ago, in 1969. The United States Defense Department worked with several universities to connect a set of computers through a network called ARPANET, allowing the government and researchers to send scientific information back and forth across the country. These first users mostly knew and trusted each other, but over the years, with the advent of personal computers, individuals outside the research community started joining the network. And in 1991, Tim Berners-Lee introduced the World Wide Web, a system for connecting files to each other across the Internet, allowing users to easily explore a vast world of information, often referred to as cyberspace. The U.S. government soon outsourced management of the network. A nonprofit organization called ICANN was created to administer the Internet's addresses and domains, and private companies sold Internet services to users. The web continued to grow exponentially, becoming the defining feature of modern life, where any user can interact with any other user anywhere, almost instantaneously. Through the Internet, businesses, governments, and all types of organizations are able to gather more information, conduct more commerce, and operate more efficiently. But with these enormous benefits come enormous challenges. The Internet was designed by a community that trusted its members to act in good faith. Yet, this important tool is no longer in the sole hands of friendly scientists. Now, four billion people, around half the world's population, have Internet access. The very connections that make our lives easier also expose us to a world of danger. Many governments are seeking to tame cyberspace by addressing three major policy issues, cybersecurity, data privacy, and online rights. Cybersecurity is about building protection against the threats that lurk in cyberspace. We upload tons of personal information to the internet, from photos to credit card numbers. And companies and governments keep intellectual property and top secret information online, too. But the internet connects all of us, and some people use it to access our information without permission. This is called hacking. Hackers often steal banking information or hold computer systems hostage for financial gain. But hacking isn't just a criminal enterprise. Hackers can also work on behalf of governments to conduct cyber espionage, stealing other countries' sensitive information for economic and military advantage. Sometimes, governments can use the stolen information as a political weapon. For example, 
Russian agents hacked the U.S. Democratic National Committee in order to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. Hackers can also conduct cyber attacks, disrupting or destroying other countries' computer systems, even potentially causing catastrophic damage in real life. The first such attack was reportedly conducted by the United States and Israel in 2008, when they used the Stuxnet computer virus to destroy one-fifth of Iran's nuclear centrifuges. Unlike traditional warfare, there's no international consensus about how governments should and should not act in cyberspace. While some countries, like the United States, may call for others to act responsibly, they resist agreeing to any rules that limit their own cyber capabilities. Even if there were rules, though, and a country were to break those rules, there's no shared understanding of how the world should respond to cyber rule-breaking. Complicating matters, cyber attacks can be nearly impossible to attribute. Hackers often mask their identities and hide their locations by routing attacks through servers in many different countries. Even if a victimized government does manage to identify its attackers, it may not be able to tell whether the hackers were working as another country's agents or whether they were working on their own. This is problematic, because traditionally, countries are deterred from attacking other countries out of fear of retaliation. But with cyber attacks, if a country doesn't know who exactly attacked it, that it doesn't know who to retaliate against. And without the threat of retaliation, countries are more likely to use cyber attacks. So without the ability to fully deter cyber attacks, it's up to countries, businesses, and individuals to protect themselves, making it harder for hackers to access information without authorization and making systems more resilient to damage when they are hacked. Improving cybersecurity can be tough for individuals because our information is exposed across cyberspace in ways we may not even know. It's a matter of data privacy, the degree to which a person controls the information they share online. You may think that you're being careful with your information, but you could be sharing it without realizing. When we visit websites, we often allow them to collect data about our age, location, activities, and much more. The companies behind those websites can sell that information and create targeted ads that follow us around the internet. And if the information is stolen, those companies have little obligation to inform us. Data privacy advocates are trying to protect our information online, but there's no global agreement as to how it should be done. Controlling how digital information is shared is not just a concern for individuals. It's also the focus of certain countries that don't value online rights the concept that everyone should have the right to full internet access. Some governments like China advocate for cyber sovereignty, arguing that their borders apply to cyberspace and they should be able to control how people and businesses use the internet within their territory. The United States and its allies disagree with this approach. They support internet freedom, the concept that everyone should be free to express themselves and interact with anyone else anywhere online, allowing for new ideas to spread freely. Amid the global disagreement, technological innovation continues to accelerate at a tremendous speed. Billions of items are getting connected to cyberspace, from cars to kitchen appliances, even surfboards, forming an ever-growing Internet of Things. This new era of connectivity underscores the need for international arrangements that would encourage responsible cyber practices and discourage harmful ones. Ideally, these arrangements would persuade governments to act responsibly and do all in their power to stop individuals, companies, and other countries from breaking the cyber rules within their territory. But we're nowhere close to establishing such arrangements, and they'll only get harder to achieve as our lives become increasingly tangled with the Internet, as the threats from cyberspace put our world in greater danger. This is the video that I use to trigger discussions and thought process during classes as well, right? Uh, what the video actually talk about, about cyber attacks or they call it hacking, right? So in the cybersecurity profession that we are doing, we always see this. It's not a question of if the attack will happen. It's a question when it has happened that you may or not be aware of. So for sure, cyber attacks in our lifetime whether once or multiple times, it will happen. It has happened maybe without you knowing as well. So in the cybersecurity space, we always talk about identifying, detecting, 
protecting, respond, as well as recover. Because we know that cyber attacks could have happened. Thereby, it's always important to be able to respond as well as recover. So this is actually the key tenets we have for cybersecurity. And these are the things that you probably will be learning if you go into this cybersecurity profession or the training as well, right? So the other thing is um, something of interest is what they talk about in US. Is there something happening over here as well? Remember a couple of years back, MOH, uh, there's a data leak of 1.4 million medical records, right? So there was a big investigation and uh, mm. there's actually an actual white paper or reports published about that cybersecurity attack. It's about 443 pages. If anybody is interested, you can go and download and read. Uh, and they talk about who actually is behind this attack. So this is actually what we call attribution, to try to find out who actually is behind the attack. Is it a nation state hackers that means sponsored by another government? Or is some other cyber criminals trying to do some damage and claim some fame for themselves? All right. Um, well, the public opinion or public statement from the government is there's no attribution, meaning they are not going to say who actually attacked Singapore. But does the Singapore government know about it? And do people within the profession know about it? Uh, well, under OSA, even we know we cannot say, right? So anyway, it's a very exciting field. And I think there's a big crowd here today. You are interested in it because this is actually a fast growing area. There's a lot of exciting opportunities which I'll touch upon as well. Next slide. Okay. Before that, let's play a very simple game. You know how to use a QR code to scan, right? All right. Can you scan this? I want to see what is your so-called cybersecurity uh, awareness, all right? As a very, very sort of uh, knowing where you are, uh, at least you know where you are today, all right? So after that, after you scan the QR code, you we'll play a simple game, all right? A, a simple quiz, maybe about five questions to check if you are familiar with some of those uh, cybersecurity uh, myths or the issues that we talk about, right? Okay, I'll give you another maybe 30 seconds to take this QR code. You probably pop out a screen called Kahoot, and after which you are supposed to enter a five digit code, then after that you can play this game using your mobile phone, right? Maybe 10 more seconds. Yeah, pin uh, he'll show the pin number shortly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you should have a screen called Kahoot that you're supposed to enter some pin number. So uh, we'll show you the pin number shortly.
So as the Singset, Singset stands for Singapore uh, Computing com Computer Emergency Response Team, issue a hundred million dollar device alert, meaning that there's hundred million devices sitting in your home and my home at any point of time can be hacked. So CSA issue a alert that these devices need to be patched urgently. Otherwise, those devices could be compromised. And this out of a billion devices out there, right? And um, while they're trying to get this up, uh, if you remember two weeks back, Facebook announced 500 over million records has been stolen. stolen. And a few days later, LinkedIn announced another 500 million records has been stolen. So good chance your record and my record, whereby we have account on Facebook, on LinkedIn, chances are if you have the same password used in those accounts, the bad guys would have got our email, our Facebook information, as well as our account, and password as well, possibly. So if you want to be assured, go back, change the password in your social media, as well as your internet access for other accounts as well. For those accounts, for example, like uh, your internet access banking, you have a 2FA, right? They actually send you a, a password or through uh, some of the uh, software, they have it as an authenticator. So that means you're locking, you need to clean something. Yes, before you can uh, go in. That is an additional layer of protection above and beyond password. So this is called a second factor authentication. So this is something that actually helps to protect yourself against some of these attacks that is already happening, right? So, all right, so can we continue? So, well, in the simple exercise, uh, XYZ has been a, a great performer, followed by, of course, the top winner is this uh, Mr. John. Great, good job, okay? So this is just a simple exercise, but we actually use this exercise to trigger thoughts amongst the students and something that they actually relate to as well. And that's where it's actually will help in their learning. In uh, the cyber security that we are doing, we learn from ourselves, we learn from one another, especially teamwork, right? So this is actually what is important. Okay, next slide. So today, what I'm gonna cover, all right, going into the slides is, why is there, I'll say, what is the demand for cyber security lab? Like? Right, um, from a career, from a profession standpoint, every time there's announcements that there's a cyber security attack somewhere, well, it is said that this unfortunate thing has happened, but from a business standpoint or professional standpoint, I'm happy because I still have a job, all right, and I always very busy, all right. So, but that's a reality. But why? Why is there such a great demand for cybersecurity professional as well as uh, people, right? As well as the solutions. And how actually you embark on a learning journey, right? Through TVI or any other means out there to embark on the journey to become or to learn about cybersecurity as well. So I'm going to cover some of this in today's session. All right. So next slide. So um, October 2020, Cybersecurity Agency, the government agency that's responsible for overall cyber hygiene and cybersecurity master plan of the Singapore, issued a report in October 2020. And this is just a snapshot of some of the numbers, right? So Singapore is a very connected society. How connected? 90% of all Singaporeans, including those babies who are just born, is connected via the internet, right? And what are the other stats? This is another interesting stat. There was a survey conducted in 2019. 20% of the people working on the street already have been hacked or suffered some kind of cyber scam or attack. And this even before the lockdown of COVID-19, which we know the number of scams has gone up, right? Remember reading about people trying to scam you and say, hey, there's a cheap COVID-19 mask or another form of vaccine that you can get. There's a lot of this going on. And this figure in 2021, 2022 certainly would have gone up at least 20, 30%. All right. And in the business world, all right, a lot of businesses, large, medium and small, has suffered some form of cybersecurity as well, attack. Okay, so the reality is everybody is in fear and they know that things were happening. So how can we help them? 
how can they get help? That was what the report is trying to say. There are some means, there are some recommendations that the government is doing as initiatives to help as well. All right, next slide. So as individual, I'm just highlighting sort of key trends right now uh, to emphasize that these are the things we can do on our own to help ourselves first, right? So things like phishing, just to talk about the email, right? They send email to you. So very careful when this email is sent to you, especially if they say they are from the bank or even the phone call. That's called phishing, voice phishing, right? You receive calls, and uh, although the number starts with plus six five, doesn't mean plus six five is Singapore. When I call you from Singapore to your phone, there's no plus six five. All right. So anything plus six five to me, that's already a red alert, a red flag. So you need to be very careful. So this kind of phishing, once you fall for it, you lose money. That's one. But you may lose other aspects of your credentials or your data that may be very, very troublesome later on. Think of it this way. If you lose the IC, you worry whether your IC is used by the wrong people to borrow money. But in internet, you lose your data, which you don't even know. They can use it in many ways to create other accounts to scam all your friends and family on Facebook and everywhere else. That's even more troublesome. So very careful when you actually talk about phishing. It's very common, all right? So, but this is something we can do for ourselves to be more vigilant and to be very careful when we receive emails out of nowhere. I always have this, uh, I tell friends and families as well, if you're not sure, put down the call or get out of the email, call that person, call the service provider, be it the bank or the hospital to find out what's happening first. So that is actually more important. Disconnect and don't do anything first. After that, call to initiate and find out what happened before you decide if there's such an incident or this, this request is legitimate or not, right? Other things we talk about is after your half a billion Facebook information that includes your name, your email address, good chance the bad guys will take your name, your email address, and guess monkey as your password because they see a lot of uh, animals on your Facebook. And they will try all the social media account, be it the LinkedIn, be it the Instagram, be it the TikTok. And if we use the same password in all this and they use the same email or Facebook account to log in, they will actually will get access to your Instagram. They will get access to all your other social media, as well as the internet access. And probably if you use the same one to log into your account to do shopping, and guess what? Your Shopee, your Lazada have all your credit card information inside, right? Once they can log in, they can transact, all right? But of course, you have your 2FA of your password, which is here, of the bank transaction to block. But that is actually how easy for them to go in using credential stuffing. They just make a guess. Because they have a lot of this database, they just need 1% of the 500 million to guess correctly. The bad guys make a lot of money, right? So things like this as well is also a concern, right? Call ransomware. Anybody has heard of ransomware? So what ransomware, as the name says, is the bad guys control your computers and say, you need to pay me some money or call ransom before you have access to a computer again. So they block all the access, all your computers, and they want you to pay money to them before they give you the key to unlock the computer. That is also common, right? So especially for big organizations, right? So uh, organizations uh, like Musk, the global shipping uh, ocean liner, they actually was, uh, they went down with a ransomware attack. They were not able to operate for a few weeks. They lost a billion dollars, all right? Within one hour or so, 60,000 computers globally all was shut down. So by the time I tried to call, hey, your computer could have been shut down, his computer already shut down. So that is actually the ransomware attack the business is very, very uh, worried about. And we have this as well. We work from home, we try to log into the office computers, right? And guess what? If our computer that we use to log into the office to do work, is not safe, it's not protected. 
Unlike if you're in the office, you log in, there's a lot of things that's added to protect like the antivirus and all the other things. This could be where the bad guys will through your computer, get to the office and to do some damage. Like for example, planting a ransomware as well. So this is common and this has happened. And this is actually where hackers are very opportunistic. They actually take into consideration and what is actually happening and that work from home, COVID-19 is a good opportunity for the bad guys to do a lot of damage if you're not too careful about. Right, so this is actually also very, very careful right now. It's going on. 2020 will continue and I believe 2021 will still happen because a lot of us are still working from home. We are not fully back into the office yet. Right, and this is actually where we talk about <clears throat> we're at home again, we do a lot of conferencing using the Zoom MS Teams. Are they secure? All right, has other people managed to try to get in? and steal information as well. So this is something is very real because of COVID-19, we work from home, we are sharing information very freely on the internet through that conference as well. So in business, we actually have to monitor all the communications, chats, file sharing, all this. And this is a big problem. In the past, government has blocked internet access because the 60,000 uh, computers in the government agencies have managed to create problems like the MOH and all that. But a lot of these government civil servants, they actually need to work from home because of COVID-19. The same problem of this came about again. So they need to look at other ways to mitigate this. So what it means is more investment, more people to monitor the cyber activity and more opportunities for all of us. All right. So this is actually what I like you to take note of. Okay, so this is actually the large trends. Next slide. So I can grab some figures. And these figures, while it's a global survey conducted by the likes of, um, I mean, this survey is for the cybersecurity market of 2020. All right, there's exponential increase in cybercrime. And thereby, this is how much money you're gonna spend. Singapore government spend up to 4% of the global, uh, the IT budget globally, uh, up to 4% uh, uh, of the IT budget on cybersecurity alone. Singapore government spent about $1.5 billion in IT. So that is a lot of spending, but yet we cannot hire enough people. That's a fact. Okay, next slide. And again, so, I'm planning for my second half and the next three years business plan. And in my business, I need to grow with professional consultants. We don't have enough people to hire. And for the work that I do, I only can hire those with pink ICs and PR because a lot of my work that I do is for government. So I can't have somebody who is not cleared for security to do the work in that particular three letter or four letter agency. That's even harder to fill up, all right? So we need to train many people, people who are in the IT background, people are not in the IT background, all right? So if you have interest and passion to get into cybersecurity, there's always opportunities for you as well, all right? Okay, next slide. So this is actually another trend from McKinsey study, all right? Um, identity access management, all these are big words. But fundamentally, think of your SingPass mobile. Now you're using SingPass mobile to log into your CPF, HDB. You can use a SingPass mobile to log in your OCBC account. And even better, facial biometrics. I don't even remember any password at all, except for my SingPass. One password can go anywhere. But one thing I need to point out, let's say you're using a Facebook, uh, using WhatsApp, using our face. So the hacker also can use our face and do it. The question is always how difficult for the hacker to guess or to uh, emulate what you're doing as a login process. Password is the easiest to guess, right? Facial recognition, well, uh, in a layman perspective, they try to use different faces or different ways to log in, so-called a brute force way. But brute force way for come to facial because your phone itself has a first 
mechanism to detect the face before you can lock in first. If you use a face lock in for your phone, second thing is you use a face lock in to uh, OCBC bank. So that is the second. And the OCBC bank uh, interaction with your face, the registration, they actually ask you to do a few things. Look at the picture, uh, look at the camera, turn left, turn right as well, because they actually want to do a 360 uh, so called enrollment of your facial feature before it becomes a trusted uh, lock in for the OCBC bank. So it's not just taking a simple face that after it can go in already. No, it's actually oh, difficult. Uh, of course, uh, if there's some uh, accident or some uh, whatever, then your facial locking may not work correct. So there will be have some other fallback. So in this kind of biometrics, uh, which is the using facial or fingerprint, there's always another way to get into the system. For example, there's a password as a fail, fail safe, just in case everything also doesn't work. All right, that's how we design a secure system. All right, next slide. So I talk about passwordless. So whatever we see this as a global survey, the Singapore government, the smart nation, we are implementing all this in Singapore. All right. So uh, very soon, even uh, non-Singaporean living in Singapore, they will use the same thing to lock in because SingPass will be made available to all these people as well. All right. So it is a very convenient, but also means that if you lose this, or somebody managed to get in to your account somehow through sync pass then the damage could be quite significant as well so the government is doing a lot to protect your identity on sync pass all right next slide so services in cyber security there's a lot of skill sets a lot of kind of services that's needed to support Identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover as well, right? So those people who are uh, required to do the investigation of why 1.4 million records were leaked, or is it only 1.4 million? Is it more somewhere else that the hackers has stolen, but we don't know yet? So there are specialists that is hired to do this kind of digital forensic work, for example, All right? So these are highly skill set, uh, high, the high demand skill sets in this space as well, All right? So after which I will introduce you, there's a very nice uh, ICT map that the government has created for you to navigate. If you're interested in specific kind of roles in cybersecurity, you can go through that. You can find what kind of skills to learn and maybe go to TVI to inquire about their kind of skills as well as causes as well, All right? Next slide. Okay, so Cloud is one of the things that is actually of interest. So in, in cyber security, we talk about the protection. In Singapore, we are talking a lot of things about cloud, digital transformation. All this is meaning that using a technology like cloud to make things easier, faster, and more agile, right? So if you're in the IT space, you're in the cyber space, you see things like cloud. And this is just a, a, a capture of the kind of um, skills and the salary and the kind of growth we see in the US. Uh, but locally, we see something like this as well. So for example, a fresh grad in IT space, a fresh grad can get $4,000 easily as a fresh grad, All right? And uh, if they're good, they progress into the big giants the last of Google, the tensors of the world, they also can skill up and earn more, All right? So this is actually some uh, stats and figures for your reference, okay? Next slide. So we talk about what is happening, All right? The cyber security and why is it all these things happening? But of course, we also interest, how can we get there as well as a learner or as a career transition from where you are today and probably into IT or cybersecurity, all right? Uh, next slide. Uh, this one, you need to uh, open the PDF. So um, this is a PDF that you can download. Uh, the link is actually called the uh, Singapore ICT Map 2020, something to this effect. And in this, they actually show you in the IT world or ICT world, all right, there's a various kind of an opportunity of jobs that you can see, be it from 
data, things like data and AI, infrastructure, right, to build an IT, like a network uh, systems, and down to cybersecurity operational as well. So for today's context, let's actually maybe just click on cybersecurity and there's a lot of roles in cybersecurity. So let's go for, let's say, vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. So we click, they'll tell you how as a vulnerability assessment and penetration testing cybersecurity professional, how you stack in the whole organization of doing cybersecurity work, right? And if you're interested to find more, you can click on this. They actually will tell you what are the specific skill sets that you need to acquire to be a good VAPT, in short, analyst, All right? So this is actually the kind of skill sets. And if I were interested to find, if I want to be a VAPT analyst, all right, I need to know some of these skill sets. For example, things like digital literacy, which is a bit generic, but what about in terms of uh, things like transaction, all right, Tra thinking. So you might actually click on this and find out more about it. And at the same time is, if you go to the career pathway, it will tell you if you have this kind of skill set, should you want to transition to other jobs in the organization, in the IT department, there is also opportunity as well for you to do transition across. All right. So this is a very nice uh, navigation map that um, you can actually go to ICT, uh, the MDA website to download or from the Skill Future website to download as well. I think I can provide the link. All right, we can show the link later on. You go back here. Yeah, you click here again. So this is generally a way, a, a very easy way for you to navigate to find what kind of a jobs and the kind of job, what kind of skills do you need to acquire to be able to attempt to go for the job interview. All right, and uh, maybe what kind of training as well that you like to plan for to go for this kind of uh, training to gain the skills in order to go for this kind of jobs. And once you're in there, what are the options in the career pathways that's actually made available for you, All right? So this is actually something that is interesting and you actually can acquire this uh, free tool from the internet. Uh, and uh, from there, you can actually try to navigate and find out more about it yourself as well, All right? Any questions? Anyway, this is actually my last slide, uh, more so to share with you about this particular very nice navigation tool in the cybersecurity as well as the ICT world, right? So uh, you go back to the start. Yeah. So I'm here um, for any other questions as well later on, if you have uh, any, All right? So if nothing else, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Yeah, back to you, Chinsu. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks thank for the opportunity. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, a uh, round of applause for Mr. Gerald, please. Yeah. Okay, uh, any of you have any questions? Because now we want to kind of open it to the floor. We understand that some of you may have certain things you would like to ask uh, after looking through. You all would like to maybe know certain things that are additional. Anything at all? Uh, we have people from the other room. Do you all have any questions? Um, Shao Yun has a question. All right. What is the best way to store all your passwords? And for password managers, Chinese or even iPhone, is there any chance it can be hacked? <laughs> please, please. <clears throat> Short answer is everything can be hacked. Uh, the question is, of course, how difficult do we want to make it harder for somebody else to hack? So the question is, can I use a password manager? So let me just explain what is a password manager. Uh, like what I highlight, maybe I have four different accounts, right? Maybe one for email for my Google. All right, one for let's say uh social media, my Instagram, one for maybe Facebook, and one for WhatsApp. Assuming I need to log in, right? The four or six digit. Now there are so many. If I keep all these as different password for different applications, how do I easily remember that? So this is actually the concept of password manager, whereby you use a password manager to store the password for all the four different applications. So much so that you only need to remember one password to your password manager. Once you log in, they actually will automatically retrieve the right password from the whatever application and use it over there as well. So is a password manager convenient? Absolutely. Is this safe? Nothing is 100% safe. So I always say <coughs> password manager, password is always one factor. 
one way to log in. The bank today want you to have the password plus OTP. So minimally, whatever password that you're using or password manager, you must turn on your OTP or second factor. Then you'll be safe. So in short, I don't trust any password manager anymore. I will turn on my OTP just to be safe. At least make it harder for the hackers to compromise accounts, be it on Instagram, Facebook, or my WhatsApp. Yeah. Just now you are saying that the plus sign. You see, all these, uh, I think this is all hacker. Right? Yeah. Good chance if they call from Singapore, they have a plus sign, plus 65. Not plus 65, all overseas. Okay, overseas, if you call it from US, it's plus one. But good chance that people are calling from overseas that you are not expecting any call, good chance it's a hacker, yes. I don't, uh, yeah, I didn't. Right. I mean, for me, I, I do have overseas calls, right? But uh, I'm also very careful because, like, if it's an overseas call from some country that I never see this kind of uh, country code before, I'll be very, very careful. Yep. Yeah. So, and yep. got six five is all. Okay. The point is, if it's called a local number, you should not see a plus six five, right? Yeah. So, like I say, I use my home number or uh, my mobile number to call you, you will never see a plus six five. You only see that nine something, 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 or six something, 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 that's all. If you have a caller ID. But if you see something calling local, it's a plus six five. Good chance it's not. In other words, anything plus six five, just ignore it. I think that's the easiest. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think I want to uh, just say this. Plus six five is usually kind of a rerouted call, am I right? Yep. That way. It's a rerouted call to show that it's from Singapore to let you think that it's a safe thing because of the country code, but there shouldn't be, because local local numbers, there shouldn't be a plus six five. So that's uh, what I, yep. I, I take away. Lah. So I think all of us have a bit of a different takeaway, if you ask me. You know, I'm someone who's also guilty of, you know, saving my passwords <laughs> automatically. So every time you have to keep taking out your credit card, you know, and you put in the details. but. Of course, after hearing uh, what has been shared, I think probably we might want to reevaluate whether that's the best plan moving forward. Uh, it's always a struggle between convenience and security, you know, and what actually works for both of us. So it's a very uh, good sharing that we had, uh, you know, by Mr. Gerald. Even this one, you say this is my friend. You use trust, it's fine. WhatsApp. <laughs> um, it could be from another number. WhatsApp, it's, uh, WhatsApp might be different. You know, I mean, don't mind me answering. What's up is actually redirect from somewhere else as well. What's up is not a local call, it's IP call. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a local. Yeah. So what happens is WhatsApp is, is a call through the internet. They actually don't use any local number. But when you pull the information out from WhatsApp, the registered details is your name, your whatever number you display over there. So this one you can do setting to actually trigger. So the point is anything on internet call has nothing to do with plus six five or not plus six five. WhatsApp is all internet calls. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. landline calls uh, means you're right. normal through your uh, service provider. Your through your mobile, through your landline, all these yeah, they don't have. Uh, if it's the if it's the WhatsApp call, uh, yeah, it probably can just be a just an IP call. That's all. Yeah. Right. Some places I believe they use IP masking. Like, I think even I, I believe like if you all take Grab, sometimes you all call the driver, you all realize the number is not you know local. Just yep. redirect the call. Uh, yeah. So, but I think most importantly is just be safe. You know, just take an extra precaution. Uh, like what Mr. Jerome mentioned, nothing wrong. If let's say you think a bank is calling you or whoever, just to go and check it out and verify. I think that small additional step, you know, is it, even though it's a bit of a you know time that's wasted, but it probably will save you a lot in the long run. Uh, in that in that case, all right. So okay, I come to uh, this portion where I'm gonna just take ten minutes of your time. Because training vision in conjunction with understanding about the, the framework of cybersecurity, we actually launched our own advanced diploma in cybersecurity as well in partnership with DC Council. For those who came down today, I believe there's a good chance some of you went through our website to take a look at who we are, what we do, what are the courses we offer. And I would just like to just take uh, 10 minutes of the time to go through a little bit on what we can potentially mm -hmm. offer you as well. Okay. Yeah. So EC Council, we actually work with EC Council, okay, which is one of the largest cybersecurity uh, trainers in, in, that, in that sense in the world, right? So actually give and deliver this particular advanced diploma in cybersecurity. So why we pick EC Council to work with us, just to give you an idea, because they are actually endorsed, yeah, I use the word endorsed, by the Department of Defense and NSA, National uh, Security Agency. I'm sure most of you have heard of NSA from movies, huh? you know, but 
really they are actually uh, endorsed by them. And the most of the defense network in the US, okay, uh, and most of people who are professionals there are actually certified by EC Council as well. So we had the pleasure of uh, having them to work with us to come on this program. Okay, and for them themselves, they are definitely one of the largest uh, trainers in cybersecurity as well. These are just some stats. They have a presence in 145 countries, even though they originate from US. They have many uh, trained professionals, okay, that they have got they have gone through their training process and are now practicing in the cybersecurity field. And more importantly, of course, they have different tools and technologies that they actually share with us. They believe in an open source system. They believe in sharing, right? And more importantly, they have many, many experts that are actually involved in the field that we are working with to conduct uh, our program. All right, so just to give you a little bit of info about EC Council and why we choose to work with them for our cybersecurity advanced diploma. The next slide, please. So if, let's say, for example, some of you are looking at options, right? So after going through this, after understanding a bit about cybersecurity, you know, maybe I think I want to know more. Maybe I think I might consider a career in cybersecurity. So whichever stage you're at, again, we hope to help you out by offering this advanced diploma in cybersecurity. This is our program, as mentioned, with EC Council. So we are looking at a one-year program on a part-time basis, okay? Part-time basis meaning that we are looking at usually uh, evening classes or even weekend classes because we understand majority of people are working adults. And we hope to, of course, within this 440 hours, uh, cover through with you, okay, on main objectives about understanding our best practices of cybersecurity, equipping you with the right skills and knowledge, and more importantly, helping you whether you're looking for a career, whether you're just looking at protecting yourself, okay, we hope to be able to offer this for you. Even if, let's say, your goal, right, is to move into, for example, a degree in cybersecurity, we hope to be able to empower and assist you with that as well. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the different modules, just to give you an idea, okay, of how we conduct our program. So we have a total of 11 different modules, um, of course, of, of different topics, okay. Each one has an assessment. Definitely, we evaluate you at the end of each module to see if you are competent, whether you are aware, whether you have, uh, you know, are able to apply the skills that we pass on to you. And definitely, you can see there's e-learning hours and classroom hours. To give you a summary of e-learning and classroom hours, this program we conduct is kind of a hybrid program, or what we call blended learning. So there are physical classes, right, which you can attend, come to our campus, so you get a chance to get up close and personal with the trainers, ask them questions as well. You know, th those can be a little bit out of topic, but definitely will still help you on, right? And more importantly, of course, you have your self-directed learning, means you can learn on the go. Some people nowadays, I mean, most of us on the bus, you know, we will scroll through our phones, uh, you know, whether it's Facebook or whatever. You can actually use that chance, you know, to actually learn and pick up as well. So you are not restricted to studying on campus, but you can kind of study as and where uh, you actually want to be. Okay, next slide, please. So these are just some of the modules I want to touch on very briefly. Uh, we talk about computer system technologies. So understanding about social and economic impact, you know, of different uh, computer technologies. Okay, don't mind the knocking, because next door, right, <laughs> they're actually doing leather. I'm not sure if you all did see, but they have a leather uh, retail shop. So probably that's why that's a bit of knocking. Yeah. So coming back to this, uh, module one, we are looking at computer system tech. So we familiarize you with the different technologies available. What are their functions? What are their applications? Okay. We talk about object-oriented design and analysis. So definitely understanding how to use a different development framework, how to utilize it well. We talk about computing math as well. So some of you may be well-versed in this area from IT background, some may not be. But either way, we definitely start you off about computing mathematics, understanding how you can use certain formulas, again, in terms of helping you uh, in terms of your programming journey as well. And we also talk about cloud computing. What is the purpose of the cloud? What can it be used for? What are the applications? And how definitely you can use it to your advantage or even integrate it into a certain system, all right? So we talk about database systems design and management. Uh, some of these might sound a bit foreign, but these are of course uh, things that would be good to know if you want to go into the field, right? We talk about network management and security, how to definitely manage different forms of security systems as well, right? Based on whether is it talking about individual or companies or organizations, we definitely prepare you for that. So we also talk about web application development as well, understanding your HTML and .NET. Anyone know what HTML is? Yeah, hypertext markup language, that's good. Yeah, so, you know, this might be a bit foreign, you know, I ask me HDR, I think, or how to meet the ladies, you know. <laughs> that's uh, probably the first acronym that comes to mind. Right? Yeah, so th th these are, of course, new concepts and new terms that, that you will come across, uh, even though they sound foreign, 
but we try to make it very easy and digestible for all of you, all right? We also talk about Python programming. Python is something that we have all heard before, right? Uh, maybe some of us have touched it, some of us have not, but we introduce you to it and we teach you how to actually use it, okay, and make it very effective in terms of whatever program you're actually building, how you can use it as a building block for programming as well, all right? And we come to the last few uh, modules. Next slide. Right, module nine, we talk about how to implement uh, definitely technologies and securities, how to actually implement them very effectively. And more importantly, how to identify vulnerabilities okay, and how to address them. Because at the end of the day, like what was mentioned, it's not about whether this will happen or not, it's that when it will happen. So how to actually prevent and even deter as well. So we, we also cover through about uh, definitely how to predict future cyber threats as well. And what are the kind of things to take note of or what government agencies out there are also looking at. What are the different kind of risks out there and how that thing we protect ourselves and the organization we are in okay so this is a brief summary of what we will be going through in our this advanced diploma in cyber security all right so these are the 11 different modules uh, fast forward to the next slide we also work with easy council not just uh, on the content but also on certification so these certifications uh, case.net certified ethical hacker and certified network defender these are awarded by easy council okay our partner and if you read read up on them, or if you look up look them up on Google, you'll find that actually their CH certified ethical hacker is one of the, I would say a world level kind of certification that the, the employers are after. Okay, so these are all to add value to you, not just having an advanced diploma, but having all these three to actually add value to you. Whether is it you want to venture into the industry, whether you want to put it on your LinkedIn, uh, you know, on your profile, that's also possible. But more importantly, the knowledge from there, how it can actually help you in your daily life, or in terms of furthering your employment, going into the field, all right? So this is a brief uh, run through and understanding of the different modules and the pricing, right? In terms of your investment, if let's say you decide to want to proceed with us, right? So we are actually working together at SkillsFuture Singapore in terms of cost fee funding, which is why you see there's a different kind of percentage. So for individuals who are actually taking up the program, individuals who are, you know, within the age of 21 to 39, right? We are looking at a cost fee of 11,000 throughout this period of one year. For individuals who are above 40 who are Singaporean, they are looking at about 2805, just to give an idea of uh, the fees, in case you're wondering, you know, how much is my investment if I want to go into uh, this field, right? That's definitely a far cry from the total cost fee of about 17,000 plus uh, because of the benefit of skills future. As you know, the government is putting a lot of uh, investment into education, wanting to upskill Singaporeans, and that's how, of course, we, together with identifying the need for cybersecurity programs, we actually put this together and offer this program to you. All right. So questions, of course, I'm going to be asking, okay, let's assume I want to take the program, how will it be, etc. Okay, our upcoming class is on the 25th, 24th of May, my apologies, <coughs> on Monday, Thursday, and Friday evenings. We are looking at evening classes, as mentioned, so we can actually have students uh, to come down after their working hours, right? And we are looking at physical classes being that the fact that I understand these terms and methodologies are, might be a little bit new to some people. Okay, our, our previous few batches of students, just to share, this will be our third batch. Our first few batches of students, uh, not all of them are from IT. Some are from marketing background. We have people who are insurance agents, property agents as well. So for them definitely to pick up programming and all that, it might be a little bit challenging if it's done online. So which is why we actually do face-to-face -face classes to actually make it easier Okay, for the lecturers and students to have definitely discussions and for students to pick up on the topics as well. All right, this will be located at our JAM campus. JAM campus is located at Jurong Gateway Road, just another one of our higher education campus. Okay, and uh, of course, today you may notice, of course, uh, the, our program consultants. We have quite a few program consultants around who are tired in red. Uh, we have Mr. Xiao in here. Maybe, yeah, I can just raise your hand. That's Xiao in. We have uh, Tadius at the back. All right, so I believe uh, if you're here today, Someone uh, actually called you down. Someone actually connected with you. That particular individual is your program consultant. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it'd be awesome if you could connect with them after this session, you know, to be able to understand a bit more about our program if you want to, or of course, to give us uh, any form of feedback on the session as well. So if, let's say, for example, you all decide to register today, uh, we also are able to waive the application fees for the program. But of course, this is on you. If let's say you want to take it further, we'll be happy to assist you with it. All right. Uh, that brings me to the almost the end of the presentation. All right. Uh, in terms of questions, I won't be really talking about or answering any more questions today because I will definitely leave you to your program consultants to assist you. I know we have all been here for some time. Most of us, you don't want to have some form of uh, movement and freedom, so that's fine. But the last thing I need from you is just this uh, feedback form, right? Uh, please scan this. 
feedback form, okay, and uh, give us your feedback on how we did today, right? Um, you can just take your time and scan this. This should be a two, two to three minute feedback form. Tell us how we did. You know, what do you feel can be improved? Um, how did you find Daphne the whole session? And of course, we hope to strive to improve uh, for future open house events and for future seminars as well. Thank you. Okay, once you're done with that, uh, just to share with you, we will be having refreshments for all of you, right? Remember, I believe some of your consultants have told you as well. So we'll be bringing all the refreshments uh, into the room so you all can enjoy it here. Right? For those of you who need a toilet break, feel free, right? But uh, the refreshments will all be in the room. Yes, Patricia. Um, Go ahead. There's a question for Jared from the Oh, okay. Um, Good question. One, how does cloud being protected? And is it true that information stored on the cloud being retrieved and it is safe to store on cloud? Okay, this is the same question that's been asked in, by the class as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, first and foremost, you got to understand what is cloud. I explain cloud computing as we go into a hotel, right? In hotel, there are many rooms. Every guest stay in different rooms in the hotel. Does the guest in room one know who is beside you in room two? No. Does room two know who is beside you in room one? No. Does a hotel has all the security at level one? Yes. But the hotel also provide a safe for you to store all your passport and valuable inside the safe? Answer is yes. So to answer the question directly, if you're storing data into the cloud, it's like checking into the hotel. Do you have access to your own data in the hotel via your room? Yes. But do you need to further protect your most important passport and all the important information inside the hotel room or in the cloud yes plus yes again meaning if i add or uh, upload certain sensitive data into the cloud i will add what you call encryption to protect the data so much so that whoever actually happens to take the data out of the room or take something out of the room they cannot use it because it's all protected so in a nutshell what you store in your iCloud your store in your Google, if you can, add another layer of protection like a password to that whatever you uploaded so that whoever wants to access it to key additional password to access that information. So whatever you're sitting in your iCloud or your whatever data today, if it's just a normal password to protect uh, as a single line of defense, it's actually fairly weak and dangerous. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. There's another question from Jaffe online. Um, the speaker mentioned he is having trouble finding candidates that have the required clearance to work for government agencies. Will having a clearance level be a plus point for employment? She also asked if how employable would be the graduates of advanced diploma in cybersecurity. Yes. John, you answered the first question first. Will having a clearance level be a plus point for employment? Um, short answer is yes. Um, if you are cleared for government security, uh, if 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 for those gentlemen here who have served SAF, so you have cleared for some level of security like CAT two or CAT two A, depending on uh, whatever uh, uh, vocation you are in uh, SAF. So it means that you have some form of uh, privy clearance. When you go for government project, you need to clear again, for sure. Every single project I do for three-letter agency, when I go for another project in four-letter agency, every single project I need to clear myself again. But because you've cleared before for some projects or because of your SAF, whatever you've been cleared before, when you go for clearance, it's easier. All right? But every single project, you need to go for clearance. I repeat, every single project, you need to go for clearance. There's no such thing as I clear for one project, therefore I'm clear to do all projects. No, that's not true at all. Okay, what's the next question? How employable would the graduates be of advanced diploma in cyber security? Um, I wouldn't be in the position to, to uh, explain how employable. Um, at the end of it all, it would depend on the individual. Uh, whether his experience, his skill set, as well as his ability to learn. And what's important is in our cybersecurity world, 
or actually in IT, you're always learning new things. Things are moving very fast, all right? So just now you see about cloud computing. Uh, cloud computing is about two years old in terms of uh, terminology. Now we are talking about edge computing, where all your uh, Fitbits, where all your other uh, devices, wearables are connecting to the cloud, is actually connecting to what they call edge. So edge is something that is going to drive the next growth for IoT. Internet, operating technology, all this. Again, that's our new terms. So when you want to go into IT cyber field, be prepared to learn. And with that mindset, with the car kind of experience and the car kind of qualification, yes, you can go far and you're highly employable. Yes. I think that's probably the best I can put it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So uh, for those who have done the feedback form, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be arranging for the refreshments uh, shortly. Right, uh, thanks to all of you for being an awesome audience. Uh, for me, myself, and the of Dream Vision and the rest of the consultants, we thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, maybe we can all just give each other a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. These courses that you put on up, all the these different syllabus or mm. modules, is this enough to get a person started? It will give you a foundation. Uh, may not be the best way to describe it, but it's actually called uh, one inch deep uh -huh. and one mile wide. I see. Yeah. Okay. Because in, in, in cyber, uh, you can go very deep in certain areas. Uh, but it's, as it is, this is uh, a good introduction. So you give a one inch deep, but one mile wide. I see. Yep. Now, and, and I, I mean, I've worked overseas for a long time. Sure. Now, I realize that in Singapore, every single company is asking you for some kind of uh, 